When I first heard about the new Pink Floyd album, The Endless River, I was apprehensive. Back in 1987, I picked up a momentary lapse of reason. This was the first album to be released after David Gilmour, bassist and principal songwriter for what would become the most famous albums in their catalog, had left the band. I thought it was a pretty good album, but even while I enjoyed it, I felt like it was trying too hard to sound like previous Pink Floyd successes. The sax solo in Dogs of War sounded too much like it was trying to sound like the sax solo in Money. The sound effects opening in one slip felt too much like it was trying to sound like Welcome to the Machine. It's true that even the most creative musical artists repeat themselves eventually, but the real skill is in how they cover it up so that you can't tell without careful scrutiny. Too much in a momentary lapse of reason felt like it was trying too hard to emulate specific songs during the band's most commercially popular time period. Roger Waters called the album a clever forgery, and to a large extent, I kind of have to agree, even though it was a forgery that I sometimes enjoyed. In fact, to me, the most original track on the album was the album's hit single, Learning to Fly, the rest of it feeling too much like Pink Floyd Light. The fact that only guitarist and drummer David Gilmour and Nick Mason's pictures were the only ones featured on the album's packaging, and that keyboardist Richard Wright was only listed as a session player, only further enforced the notion to me that this was Pink Floyd in name only. But to be fair, most music critics and fans feel the same about the final cut, that this is really just a Roger Waters solo album released under the name of Pink Floyd. And even keyboardist Richard Wright has stated that A Momentary Lapse of Reason is a David Gilmour solo album. And because of all of this, I completely ignored the division bell when it came out. And it's too bad that I did, but I'll talk more about that in a moment. The news came out that the Endless River recordings originated from jams that took place during the Division Bell sessions. Not necessarily discards, but musical ideas that were recorded but never completed. And that David Gilmour and Nick Mason went back to these recordings from the 90s and using 21st century technology, added new instrumentation, and that David Gilmour was also calling the album a tribute to uh, their late keyboardist Richard Wright, whose posthumous performance is prominent on this album. But given my feelings about this being Pink Floyd in name only, I was apprehensive that this was just another way to cash in on the band's legacy. But I wasn't a music critic back then, and those feelings developed before I took this gig. So before writing this, I listened to The Division Bell for the first time, and to my surprise, I really, really liked it. While a momentary lapse of reason felt like it was trying too hard to sound like Roger Waters was still in the band, on the Division Bell, it felt as though this new version of the band had found its way. Sure, the sonic atmospherics that we associate with Pink Floyd were still there, but the songs were strong without having to emulate the Waters era. This album felt like it was paving its own way, and while it was no dark side of the moon, I would even go as far as to say that there was a sense of promise that there was even something better yet to come. Also, while doing research for this review, I discovered that Richard Wright's inclusion as a session player rather than as an actual band member had more to do with the legal obstacles of his departure after recording The Wall. And so with a renewed sense of hope, I plunged into the Endless River. It is with much regret that I find I cannot recommend the album, though. It's not a terrible album. It's not even a bad album. For me, it's just an okay album. There are moments when it's guilty of the same faults as momentary lapse of reason musical moments that sound too much like specific moments during the band's peak period. But mostly it just seems to meander. There are a few bright spots. The 80s sounding Anacena is very uplifting. But these moments can't sustain the entire album. Most of the album feels like the instrumental interludes that would have come between the lyrics of albums like Wish You Were Here and Animals, only not as melodically focused. Recording an almost entirely instrumental album might have been a bold move or a bad idea depending on your point of view. My point of view is the former. Pop and rock instrumentals were once very common, but have sadly faded out of view in the current world of popular music. And this fact makes me even sadder to have to say that I can't really recommend it unless you seek a rock ambient soundtrack for your next party. I found myself thinking, in light of their recent reunion at the Live 8 concert, that it's too bad Roger Waters couldn't rejoin them for this last effort. Perhaps he could have found a better way to use those recordings and like the surviving Beatles did with Real Love and Free as a Bird, use technology to give us uh, at least a few reunion songs, if not a whole album. 
but then maybe he might have found the whole thing to be too creatively restrictive. Before writing this review, I watched a video of David Gilmour and Nick Mason discussing the recordings. They said they spent two years working on this and both seemed terribly sincere about the effort they put into it and about it also being a tribute to Richard Wright. I do still applaud David Gilmour and Nick Mason for putting all commercial concerns aside and recording an almost completely instrumental album. I can't even say with all authority that adding vocals would have helped or not. But when the final and only track with vocals entitled Louder Than Words does come in, its lyrics do sum up that the band's musical legacy is more important than any infighting, problems, and disagreements that its individual members might have had with each other over the years. It's not a great song, but considering that this is being called the last Pink Floyd album, at least this one track is a somewhat fitting coda for the band. I just wish that I could say that for the rest of the album. Lastly, before finishing up this review, I went to Amazon and read a lot of very articulate and very positive reviews from fans about this album, many of them making extremely good points as to why they felt this way. I'm a fan too, and I respect just how well so many of these positive reviewers make their points about this album. I just wish that I could have felt the same way. For Music Worth Buying, this is TJR. Please subscribe to the channel. And thanks for watching.